Hi, my name is Mustafa Aydın. I live in Ankara, Turkey. I'm an astrophotographer and amateur astronomer. Astrophotography is really great if you like nature and the night sky. There are some types of astrophotography which varies according to the equipment you use or what you take photography of. Your class project is to learn how to plan, shoot and post-process Milky Way photography, also known as nightscapes. I will use the term astrophotography during the lesson, but our goal is to plan, take and post-process Milky Way photographs at the end of these lessons. And I cannot really wait to see how great photos you will create. This is the first lesson of a series of three lessons. In this one, we are going to learn what we need, how we are going to plan and what settings we are going to apply on our camera. Second lesson is going to be about taking the shots outside. And third lesson is going to be on how we will post-process the images we have taken. Let's start with the ingredients as if we are cooking. We all need these following items when we are taking astrophotography. We will be talking about all these items in the following slides in details. So what we need is a DSLR camera, fast wide angle lens, a tripod, a headlamp, star application for smartphone, which is optional, intervalometer remote timer, which is also optional, dark place and night, patience, and a friend. A DSLR camera is a digital camera with manual settings, interchangeable lenses, full frame APS-C or three quarter sensor, or a mirrorless digital camera. What we mean by full frame or APS-C is the size of the sensor that your camera has. Full frame camera has larger sensor than APS-C and APS-C has larger than three quarter and so on. As photographing is collecting light, which is also more important in astrophotography, the larger the sensor, the more light the lens will collect. Which DSLR camera to buy? A Canon, Nikon, others? It's totally your choice. If you have a Nikon lens set, uh, which you already had, then go for a Nikon. And let's say you have a friend who has a Canon lens set, then buy a Canon. APS-C or full frame, this is all about your budget. As full frame cameras are more expensive than APS-Cs, then you'll have to choose according to your pocket. What I really recommend you to buy, a camera which has a tilting display, because when you're close to the ground, you will easily tilt your display and see what you have on your screen. Canon 60DA and Nikon D810A. These cameras are especially manufactured for astrophotography, which means there is a special filter which cuts the infrared light for daily use photographs. This filter is taken or weakened for astrophotography. So these cameras are especially manufactured for astrophotography and of course the price is a little bit higher than the normal cameras. Fast wide angle lens. The lens is one of the most important parts of taking the astrophotography, which might be sometimes pricier than the camera itself. I personally recommend 24 mm or shorter for APS-C sensor cameras, 35 mm or shorter for full frame cameras, 17 mm or shorter for cameras with three quarter sensors. If you have a camera which came with a kit lens, which is 1855 mm generally, is just good enough to start with. So you can, you can start taking photographs with this lens because like I said, lenses might be really pricier and if you don't have extra money to spend on lenses, you can just start with this lens. Better results, you will need a fast lens with lower F number. A good tripod is really important for astrophotography as we are taking photographs in the dark and applying long exposures. Once you invest on a good tripod, it will most likely serve you a quite long time. You need a tripod which is stable and sturdy enough to carry your camera and the lens. Lightweight is always better because you will have to carry your equipment and tripod 
the lighter the tripod is easier to carry and you will need a ball hat rather than a video type uh, tilting hat tripod hat a headlamp is more than important i personally recommend a headlamp with a red night vision which will protect your eyes from blinding if you are new to astronomy and don't know how to navigate through the sky a story application on your cell phone will be very helpful these applications are map of stars planets and other celestial objects as well as the milky way they are very easy to use and free apps are available both for android and ios the most famous application is Stellarium. it is paid for android and ios but it's free on on your laptop many other unpaid applications for android and ios are available intervalometer remote timer is optional an intervalometer will make using your camera easy remotely without touching it this is especially useful to prevent vibration in the camera which will blur your photographs but still using intervalometer remote timer is optional since you may have self timer to avoid vibrations and some cameras already have integrated intervalometers this tool is really useful if you are taking time lapse photography or if you need exposures more than 30 seconds since most of the cameras allow you maximum 30 seconds of exposure other than bulb mode of all the items on the list a dark location is most likely hardest to find depending on where you live not very interestingly two-thirds of the people living in united states has never seen milky way because of light pollution and will never see that's why we really have to find a dark place far from big cities to avoid light pollution to find dark skies we can use light pollution maps if you realize topic on this slide is dark place and dark night what we mean by dark night is a night without moon you should certainly avoid moon if you are taking astrophotography as we want a moonless light we have to choose a night between the two third and the first quarter of the moon new moon is even better since we don't see the moon at all we will be talking about light pollution maps and dark skies in the further slides with more details as you remember there were two more items in the equipment list which actually are not equipments patience and a friend you really need to be patient for astrophotography because planning taking the photos and post-processing them take a lot of time there are also factors that you cannot control like the weather clouds planes right in the middle of your photos etc all these demand you to be patient the other item is a friend as you are going to be at a remote place at dark times of the day having a company who may help you handing you the equipment you need or a cup of hot tea or coffee moreover you will feel safer against any kinds of threats that may come from the nature if you have a friend with you before we start to talk about planning i recommend all of you to make a checklist for the equipment you will need of course you may want to add more items on the checklist depending on the weather or where you go and how long you will be there some spare clothes hot or cold drinks your medication if you have any and so on make sure all your equipment is ready and fully charged you wouldn't want to find out your battery is empty or you forgot your memory card after driving long distances when there is a crystal clear sky and you will not be able to take a single frame because you forgot something I personally think that the planning of shooting the Milky Way is 8% of the whole process. Only 20% is taking the photos and post-processing. That's why every time we want to go, we should plan our astrophotography sessions carefully. Planning consists of these items, where and when, light pollution, phase of the moon, weather forecast, knowing your equipment the first step of the planning is where we will go and when we will go and is there going to be light pollution where we go so we will use light pollution maps one of the 
Light Pollution Maps that I use is www.darksidefinder.com. This is a very useful website that you can find your area and you can see how light polluted your area is. For light pollution, we can also use light pollution maps for Android or iOS. My favorite light pollution map is light pollution map where you can find for Android. The first and the most important part of the planning is to find a place with dark sky. Let's see how I use light pollution map and the star chart software Stellarium to plan where I will go. To plan where we will go, we will use light pollution map. The light pollution map that I use is dark side finder. We click on the website, then click on map, then click on the open map. Once we are in the website, we will see a map of the world. And as you can see, there is a color code. The darker the picture is, the less light polluted, the brighter the picture is, the more light polluted area we are looking at. As I'm living in Ankara, Turkey, I'm zooming in. And I can see the center of Ankara is very, very light polluted. And as we are going further from the center, it's getting less and less and less light polluted. One of my favorite places to go for astrophotography is Nallahan. So, in this area especially, uh, there is a fairly less light pollution. Now, what we will do is, we will go to Stellarium, which is a free software where you can download from Stellarium.org. Now we are on Stellarium. To go Nalhan, visually, we will pick the location window and type the name of the city, Nalhan, Turkey. Now we are actually there in Nalhan, virtually. So it is 3.30 p.m. And since we are in the early spring, we will not be able to see uh, Milky Way at this time of the day. So we can also change date and time. It's going to be tomorrow morning and it's going to be 4 a.m. in the morning. Let's move to 4 a.m. Now, we are in Nalahan tomorrow morning at 4 a.m. As you can see, almost on south, we can see the Milky Way. Once we arrive Nalahan and put our camera on the tripod, we will have to turn it towards south so we can take the picture of the Milky Way. We learned how to use light pollution maps and stellarium. One part of the dark sky is uh, a night without a moon. As we mentioned before, we need to find a night without moon or less moon. So what we need to do is we need to go out and take photographs when uh, the third and first quarter of the moon. There are planning applications for astrophotography. One of the famous one is the Photographer's Ephemeris or another planning application is photo pills for iOS. You can also find moon phase in the website www.timeanddate.com slash moon slash phases. Another important part of the planning is checking the weather. Before you go out, you have to check the weather to make sure that it will not be cloudy, it will not be rainy or too windy. For that, uh, you can use your local weather forecast or there are websites that you can find online to check uh, the weather availability. Uh, my favorite website is clearoutside.com slash forecast. In this website you can write the zip code or the name of the town where you live or the or the coordinates of where you are going to be for taking photographs then uh, you can get the forecast. 
In this website, you can also see the phase of the moon, what time the moon will rise and what time it will go down. Uh, you can see uh, the level of cloud in percentage. You can see the humidity. You can see the possibility of rain. You can see the temperature and you can plan your trip for astrophotography with this website. But you can also find other websites uh, for weather forecast. If you are new to your camera, read the user's manual carefully and learn how to change the settings before you go outside. Since you will be in the dark and sometimes you will have to move quickly, uh, you will need to know your camera and your other equipment very well to be able to change it effectively and also in the short time. This was the last part of planning uh, according to my lesson. I also recommend you to make a flowchart or a list that you can check before you go out for taking pictures that you planned everything very well. Camera settings. This is the last part of our uh, first lesson. In this part, we will learn what kind of settings we will apply on our camera. We will learn aperture versus ISO. We will also talk about exposure versus focal length. We will talk about long exposure noise reduction settings. We will talk about manual focusing and how we are going to manage to focus. The first and one of the most important settings we need to do on our camera is to set it to manual mode. By this setting, we will be able to set everything manually on our camera. Change your image quality to RAW format. We need to take in RAW format because it consists of more information than the compressed JPEG format, which most cameras shoot normal daily photos. As we are taking the dark night sky and need a lot of information, we really rely on capabilities of RAW format. We will discuss more about RAW format in the third lesson, which is the post-processing lesson. As we discussed earlier, we need a sturdy tripod to avoid vibrations on the camera. Another tool will help us in terms of less vibration is the self-timer. By setting the camera to self-timer, the camera will take the photo seconds after we touch the shutter. This will help fading the micro vibrations on the camera and help taking photos of pinpoint stars. We set the white balance in auto mode. As we take the photos in raw format, white balance information will not be in the photo, which means we can change the white balance during the post processing. What is aperture? Till now, we talked about basic settings on our camera. Now we are going into deeper about settings. In this part, we are going to evaluate aperture versus ISO. But first of all, we need to know what is aperture. Aperture is one of the three pillars or variables, if you will, of photography, the two others being ISO and shutter speed or exposure. And every photographer should thoroughly understand them. The main goal is to collect as much light as possible and these three variables make you able to collect more light in different ways. Now we will see what they are and how they affect the photographs we take. We start with understanding the aperture. In optics, an aperture is a hole or opening through which light travels in. In our case, it's the lens. These numbers you can see are the f number which you can easily see on your lens. The smaller the number, the wider the aperture is, which lets more light through your lens, while the bigger numbers are narrower apertures. We also call lenses with smaller f number fast lenses. As you remember, we are taking astrophotography. We are taking photos of very dim objects that make us need more and more light. Imagine two buckets that we collect rainwater with. One of the buckets has an opening diameter of 10 cm and the other has 20 cm. 
Which bucket collects more water under the same rain? Of course, the one with 20 cm opening. What we are doing while taking photography is almost the same, but collecting light instead. Every lens has lower and upper F numbers. We need to go for the lowest F number possible when we are taking the Milky Way photographs. We are not still setting the aperture on our camera because we still have to understand the relation between ISO and aperture. ISO is the level of sensitivity of your camera to available light. The lower the ISO, the less sensitive it is to the light, while a higher ISO number increases the sensitivity of your camera. The part within your camera that can change the sensitivity to the light is called image sensor or sensor. This part is responsible for gathering light and transforming it into an image. When you increase the ISO number, you kind of increase the light sensitivity of your sensor that makes you able to take photographs when there is not enough light source without using a flash. So good to be true. It is true. But higher ISO comes at a cost. It adds grain or noise to the image. The grain or the noise is not something we really want in our images. The noise is the fractal look in the photo caused by the heat of the sensor of the camera, long exposure and high ISO. If you have a look at the picture here, as we increase the ISO, the picture gets noisier and noisier. So we have to find a correlation between ISO and aperture where we are collecting as much light as possible through the lens while we are setting the highest ISO possible and yet keeping the grain the lowest. Here is the correlation I was talking about. This chart shows you for what aperture number is good with what ISO number. As a beginner, I recommend you to stick to these settings while you can start experimenting as you start to understand the aperture and ISO. As you can see here, uh, we have different F values and different ISO values. For F1.4, I recommend you to use ISO 1600. For F2, ISO 3200. For F2.8, ISO 6400. And for F4, ISO 12800. But like I said, Increasing the ISO increases the sensitivity of your sensor to the light, but also it increases noise. So you have to pick the right ISO to have less noisy pictures. Lower the ISO, as you can see in the chart, less noise. Higher the ISO is more the noise. Understanding the previous and this slide, set your camera to the suitable ISO and aperture. As I stated, there is another variable you can always play with, the shutter speed or the exposure. Exposure versus focal length. So let's start with the definition of exposure. Exposure, also known as shutter speed, is the length of the time camera shutter is open and camera sensor is exposed to the light. Camera shutter is a curtain in basic words, which covers the sensor, avoiding it to be exposed to the light. When you push the shutter button on your camera, this curtain opens and lets the light in through your lens. As you can see, this is the last variable which we can play with to adjust amount of the light we will collect. With exposure, we can either freeze the moment or blur the motion. In our case, we want to freeze it. Even though exposure helps us let the sensor exposed to the more light, there is a limit that we can apply as exposure time as earth rotates around its own axis and since we are on earth it looks like the stars move throughout the night exposure is the setting that will help us freeze them in this picture we see what happens increasing exposure time we want our stars look like in the picture uh, you can see on the left hand side not like the one in right hand side as we correlated iso and aperture here we also have to correlate focal length and exposure time. Let's start with what is focal length. To make it simple, focal length shows how much you will zoom 
to the object and how much you will see surrounding of it. It's measured in millimeters. The lower the focal length value, the less you zoom in and wider the field of view is. On the other hand, the higher the focal length, the more you zoom in and narrower the field of view is. You see in this picture, on the left hand side, when you go towards right, the focal length increases but the field of view is uh, narrower. For astrophotography, focal length is connected with the exposure time. Remember, we need more lights but we do not want our stars appear as lines which is called star trails. We need to know maximum exposure time which we can use with the lens we own. This is why we need to learn 500 rule. This rule tells us what could be the maximum exposure time with the given lens before stars appear as lines. 500 rule is very simple. Exposure is equal to 500 divided by focal length. And if your camera has APS-C or cropped sensors, we need to multiply focal length by crop factor, which is 1.5 for Nikons and 1.6 for Canon cameras. In this chart, we can see different focal lengths and the exposure times that we can use for these focal length lenses. For instance, let's say we have 10 millimeter focal length lens on APS-C camera. Then we have to use 30 seconds of exposure maximum. And for 12 millimeter on APS-C, we can use 25 seconds and so on. If we have full frame camera, then for 14 millimeters, uh, we can use 30 seconds at exposure. You can find the exposure values using 500 rule for these APS-C and full frame sensors and for these lenses. For instance, let's say we have an icon camera with APS-C sensor and 10 millimeter lens. If we calculate using 500 rule, we will find 33.3 seconds. What we have to remember is we always have to round down. In this case, it's 33.3 seconds, but in the chart, you can see 30 seconds. We also have to remember the lower the focal length, the wider the field of view is. And on the other hand, the bigger the focal length, it's narrower the field of view. If you have a lens with a focal length which is not shown here, you can calculate exposure time using 500 rule depending on your focal length and type of your brand of your camera. If you come up with a value, let's say 14.6, do not ever round it up. Round it down to 14 and set exposure time to 14 seconds. Once again, I recommend you to stick on the 500 rule being a newbie. While you are getting better, you may experiment. We mentioned that we will be taking photos with long exposure times. Long exposure and high ISO causes noise. That's why we have to turn the long exposure noise reduction on. You can see here there's a dramatic change on noise level when we do that. Find the settings on many of your camera and set it on. Last setting we have to do is manual focusing. We have to turn manual focus on both on camera and on the lens. By this way, we will be able to focus at the infinity. We don't want to do the focusing automatically because your camera will never be able to focus on the stars when it is at the autofocus mode. Focusing at night is tricky. It's really better to focus camera, making the composition and tape focus ring of your camera. You should avoid setting the focus ring to the infinity mark because we want to have precise focusing. There are some methods that you can use for focusing. The first method we can use is live view. If your camera supports live view, turn it on. Center a bright star on the screen and focus until the star appears like a pinpoint. You may need to change live settings on your camera to exposure simulation or manual to be able to see the star. Once the star appears like a pinpoint, leave the focus ring 
right where it is and tape it so you wouldn't change the focus accidentally. If you cannot see the stars on LCD screen, try focusing on a flashlight at a distance. This is an easy way to get your camera to focus at close to the infinity in the dark. If you are alone, it might be hard. This is where a friend comes handy. Place your flashlight towards an object at a distance around 100 feet or greater. Focus on the lit object and fix your focusing ring. Another method is using focusing filters, which we will only mention but we will not use in beginner level. It's called Bahtino mask or filter which you can use in front of your lens while your camera is pointed to a bright star. This filter creates star spikes at the star you are pointing. The idea is to center all the spikes you see. Once the spikes are centered, you are precisely focused at the infinity and ready to go. Our first lesson ends here. Our second lesson will be about how we will take the Milky Way photography. But now, if you like, you can go out and experiment taking Milky Way photography with the things we learned in this lesson. Bye and take care till we meet again in the second lesson.